Great, uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we submit this uh, day, this time into your hands. Well, we welcome you, even as we study about uh, your church. Father, I pray, uh, Lord, that you will continue to pour out your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, your insights uh, as we learn from your word, God. I pray that there will be uh, revelation in everything that we learn, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you all for joining in um, for today's course on the local church. Um, we move in to chapter 19 um, from today and we complete section one. We've completed section one and section two. Uh, section two is where we elaborated uh, about uh, the different aspects of the church, um, the 10 different aspects of the church, right? From the body of Christ uh, to the vine, to the branches, to as the bride, um, as Zion, as the people, chosen people of God, and as so many other aspects of, of it, right? Um, and, um, and, and we see how God's heart is there in each and every single aspect um, of the local church and everything that we studied in detail, right? And so now we move on to the third section, um, beginning from chapter 19, uh, page 123 in your PDFs, uh, we, we learn about the sacraments of the church. Okay, that's what this chapter is all about, is uh, some of the practices uh, that were that Jesus commanded um, his people back then to uh, continue to pursue. So that's what we will be looking at, right? So, um, so when we talk about when we mention uh, the word say ordinances or sacraments, um, you know these were the practices basically, uh, which was ordained ordinance ordained right by uh, by Jesus himself uh, to be um, to be permanently observed by the church right. So in, in all the different ages and stages, um, these there are certain ordinances practices that that we were meant to follow. Um, for the you know for a long time to come okay and so one uh one of those practices is water baptism right um now these remind you that these uh, ordinances are are to be practiced by the believer right and they it also means by which the power of jesus is also unleashed uh, is released right um that's the finished work of the cross becomes real and effective uh in a believer's life when we practice uh, practice these ordinances uh the sacraments uh the finished work of the cross is released uh, in our lives over our lives um, as well okay and so what is the first ordinance is the water baptism right um so that's what we will look at um so water baptism it's introduced by john the baptist um that's why we call him john the baptist uh he introduced a water baptism uh, when announcing the kingdom of heaven on earth as a sign of repentance right that was his uh, famous uh, message what was his famous message what was john the baptist's famous message Yeah, go ahead, Anita. Uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah, um, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, for the kingdom of God is near. Yeah. yeah so that was his uh, famous message uh, that led to repentance. And as a sign, as an expression of uh, repentance, was uh, people choosing to get baptized in the water, right? So John the Baptist introduced it. Uh, Jesus was baptized. Um, you know, although he had nothing to repent from, but it was to demonstrate obedience to full, uh, fulfill all righteousness, right? And so, um, let's read a couple of scriptures there. Can can I request some uh, one of you to read Matthew chapter three, verse uh, thirteen to sixteen, please? Matthew chapter okay. three, verse yeah, thirteen to sixteen. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. 
As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Jafina. Right. Uh, I mean, can you imagine uh, John's uh, situation? Uh, you know, John is the forerunner, uh, bridegroom's best friend, a best man, so to speak, right? Um, and so he's baptizing people, those who are repenting of their sins and whatnot. And then here comes Jesus. You can just only imagine his plight, right? It's like, <laughs> why are you coming here? What do I have to do with you kind of things, right? But uh, Jesus replies um, <clears throat> beautifully. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, guys. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 16. It's a wonderful thing. So Jesus himself came forward to demonstrate uh, obedience to fulfill all righteousness right um and so john the baptist introduces it he jesus gets baptized by john the baptist he jesus chooses to be baptized by john the baptist um and then we go on to see that baptism is a command in the new testament um matthew chapter 28 verse 19 and uh 20 uh verse 19 itself we all know this uh verse right go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples baptize them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit okay it's very baptism simply basically what what we will learn sooner is it simply means immersion being brought into as well right so baptizing them uh, in the name of the father son and the holy spirit so that's also a commandment right and baptism expresses your decision to follow jesus christ alone uh, baptism is a symbol of the inner experience of death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus. Right. And so can someone read Romans chapter 6, verse 4, please? Okay, I'll read it for us. Romans 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 4, it says, When we were baptized, we died and were buried with christ we were baptized so that we would live a new life as christ was raised to life by the glory of god the father okay so when we were baptized we died and were buried with christ we were baptized so that we would we would live a new life as christ was raised to, uh, to life by the glory of god the father okay um so that is a symbol an expression also right so we we go into the water uh old man dies we're buried and we are resurrected as a new being as a new creation uh itself right so that's the belief uh, baptism is also an expression of your desire to maintain a clear conscience before god right um so anyone uh first peter peter chapter 3 verse 21 First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, also not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. Thank you. Right. So uh, those um, I'm reading, let me read from ESV. Right, so First uh, Peter chapter three was twenty-one. Right, so baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right, uh, now in the Old Testament, there was water involved in cleansing yourself. Right, uh, priests uh, in the tabernacle of Moses before they entered um, the holy place, where it had the table of showbread, uh, and the lampstand, and the the altar of incense before they would go there in the outer courts there were two parts isn't it one was the altar of sacrifice and the other was the brazen laver or bronze laver so it was made of bronze on the outside and uh it was like a basin where the priests would wash themselves would cleanse themselves before they entered and inside of the basin was made of all uh was made of mirrors right and so uh we see that god's word being referred to waters many times in the scripture which symbolizes that where it cleanses us 
right? But then here, Peter is saying, okay, hey, this baptism is not only cleansing the dirt, it's not just that, but it is an appeal to God for a good conscience uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Um, so that's what's happening uh, in baptism as well. So already there's quite a lot. So we see that John the Baptist introduces it. Jesus was baptized by him. We all know this. It's a command. Uh, it's a commandment in uh, Matthew 28. Uh, <clears throat> baptism is an expression to uh, your decision to follow Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, I mean, in my experience, at least, uh, after many youth camps, most of the youth uh, decide to get water baptized because uh, something happens in the camp and they decide to give their life to Jesus. Maybe they have responded to an altar call and whatnot. And now they want to express it, you know, declare it, proclaim it kind of a thing. So I'm going to choose to get water baptized. Uh, you know, and so that's like a public proclamation saying that I'm a follower of Christ now, and that's kind of an official stamp or a seal kind of a thing, right? Um, the seventh point there the only requirement to be baptized is repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, can uh, someone read Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, please? Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So uh, the only prerequisite uh, there, the requirement, uh, in other words, is that you need to repent and believe to be water baptized. Um, there is no fancy five-step process or seven-step process or, uh, or all these things that anyone can come up with. Right? The simple requirement is that hey, you need to repent. Uh, say that I'm, I'm a sinner and I need you and I accept you as my Lord and Savior who died on the cross for my sins and I believe that you rose again from the dead for me. So you, you believe that you're ready to get water baptized, right? Um, bapt uh, someone again read uh, baptism is immersion by water. I mean, we just read that uh, scripture so you don't have to read it again. Baptism is immersion in water only. Now, uh, why is that standing out? Uh, as you might all know, that point is uh, there are certain denominations or um, backgrounds that believe in baptism as a sprinkling of the water. Um, but it's what they do. But, but in our context, what we believe is that baptism um, is completely, it's only immersion in the water, right? You, all right. Um, but I mean, so there are exception cases. For example, uh, I mean, if a person is, uh, um, and this is a rare exception, guys, okay? and you know, we need to understand, we need to be a little wise uh, how, or have some common sense, in other words, to say, okay, so if a, if a person is medically ill or medically or physically challenged, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you can't get that per, uh, person uh, you know, into the water well or a river or a pool. Um, so those are the exceptions that you, you know, you know what to do in that moment, right? Um, so that's the exception. But otherwise, what we strongly believe is that baptism in itself um, is immersion, right? Uh, it actually comes from a Latin Greek word, immersio, kind of a thing. So simply means immersion. Um, you do not have to become very holy to be baptized. Uh, people were baptized as soon as they repented and believed in Jesus Christ. I mean, baptism was for the was for the sinners it was not for the holy isn't it uh, otherwise uh, you know john the baptist message as we just uh, saw was that repent uh, all you holy people come and get baptized it was not uh, john's message isn't it so you don't have to become holy or self righteous suddenly uh, and what not but you need to just repent and believe once again reiterated and water baptism will not make you a spiritual giant Okay, uh, you still must grow spiritually through the word and prayer. 
okay um so i mean i i got baptized in uh january 11th 2001 and so i was like okay i got baptized now and i think now i'm like some kind of a superhero kind of a thing uh <laughs> I, you know i don't have to uh do much to grow now but i was so wrong it's fine i was young but <laughs> uh but then once you've declared publicly that you are that you are a follower of jesus christ and jesus is your lord and savior uh you need to continue to grow spiritually where you need to study his word uh you need to meditate on his word uh grow uh is in grow spiritually in maturity right etc so uh you still must grow spiritually through word and prayer because baptism is an act of obedience you can expect increased measure of blessing um right so one of the when we see it, when Jesus was baptized, right, uh, it says, um, and I like this in the Gospel of Mark, it says, and I think New King James Version or NASB, I'm not sure. It says, um, he, the heavens were torn apart, right? There are different translations that says, rend the heavens, like he tore the heavens open and came down. It's almost, uh, it's not almost, it's, it's like, I I think Isaiah 66 or 64, I'm not sure, guys, I forget it. It's like Isaiah's prayer saying, Isaiah, won't you rend the heavens and come down? Like, won't you tear open the heavens and come down? Uh, and we see that imagery in Mark chapter 2, and Jesus was baptized, it's saying the heavens tore apart, and then the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and rested on Jesus. Um, right? And so, uh, with that as an act of obedience, there is a release right and i mean the heavens could have torn apart tore open any time the holy spirit could have descended any time uh, but then it happened when jesus chose to obey and surrender completely and get baptized in the water right um so point 12 there because baptism is a symbolic proclamation of the cross you can expect the power of the cross to affect your life Okay, just go through that with me. Because baptism is a symbolic proclamation of the cross. What is uh, what's the proclamation of the cross? It's death, burial, and the resurrection, isn't it? That's the simple message of the cross. And so, all of because all of that is represented in in bapt in baptism, you can expect the power of the cross to affect your life in breaking bondages, addictions, break, bringing deliverance, and more during baptism. Right? Uh, it says somewhere in Colossians, right? Uh, when it says when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he made a public spectacle of the enemy. Right, uh, it's like he humiliated them publicly, where he, he, all of their power was taken, their sting was taken, um, and so we can expect that same power of the cross to work uh, in, in us, um, right? When we, uh, when we, uh, uh, when we get water baptized. Okay, and so, um, and. And all of this, as it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, baptize them in the name of Jesus. Right? And so that means we've been given this authority, right? The authority of Jesus' name has been given to us, right? The same, uh, if you remember, Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 15, I think, uh, Acts chapter 9 verse 15, God tells Ananias to go and meet with Paul. Uh, he is a vessel I've chosen to carry my name. Right? And so just the same way you and I carry the name of Jesus, which simply means we are here in his place. We are here as him. Right? You know, we represent him as his ambassador. We are acting on his behalf. That's a huge responsibility. Okay, and it's an incredible honor. When we say we are gathered together in Jesus' name, we're going to do this in Jesus' name, 
especially when we say, I'm going to baptize you in Jesus' name, uh, we are representing him. We are in his place and we are acting on his behalf. Uh, that needs to sink in, uh, guys. I mean, for, for us to know that we are acting on Jesus' behalf. Wow. I mean, if you have siblings, you know what I'm talking about or anyone, you know, it's like, hey, daddy told me, you know, to do this. There's a different kind of a tone or authority. My four-year-old understands this, right? If, if, uh, if mom said no TV and I said, and if I didn't know that she said, okay, and if I said uh, no, uh, yes to the TV, then, um, you know, all, everything is going to break loose at home. It's like, why? because mama said this and dada said this. So uh, kid understands power and authority. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I mean, how much more should we, right? And so, and that's the beauty and the power of baptism. Uh, it's, it's it's just uh, plunging into the water, but then the the meaning and the message and the symbol that it carries is so deep, right? We are just partaking of a practice that's been happening for ages, for two thousand odd years, right? And in just that we are saying that I'm part of this church. I'm part of the body of Christ, right? Um, and and this unites us from all parts of the world, isn't it? What this is one of many things that we do that bring that unites us together, isn't it? Like we we sing and celebrate God's faithfulness. We worship Him. Uh, we come together for every Sunday service uh, and whatnot, and so. Uh, yeah, um, so that's water baptism. That's one of the sacraments uh, that Jesus commanded that we that we do uh, right, that that we follow faithfully, right? Um, are you guys with us? Any question? Any thoughts that you'd like to add or say? Right, so that means we are all in agreement. We don't need to have a debate about anything. Okay, all right. Fantastic, okay. Okay, um, so the, going on to the other sacrament is the Lord's uh, table. Right, um, the Lord's table was instituted by instituted by Jesus Himself. Um, so I am going to request someone to please read Matthew chapter twenty six, verse eighteen to thirty. Matthew chapter twenty six, verse eighteen to thirty. I think it'll be good. Eighteen to. Eighteen to thirty, Matthew chapter twenty-six was eighteen to thirty. Okay, Matthew chapter twenty-six was eighteen to thirty. He replied, "Go into this city to a certain man and tell him the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house." So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But O oh, to that man who betrays the Son of Man, it would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the wine from now on until the day when I drink it and you 
with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Right. Thank you, Jafina. I like the last verse also. Uh, it says, when they had sung a hymn. Um, so, uh, wow, they sang uh, and they worshipped. Right. Uh, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, but this whole thing, um, it starts off with, uh, I will keep the Passover. Right. Um, so uh, what can you tell me about what what is Passover? Anyone? Uh, as in, I'm sure you're aware of this. What was this practice all about? Um, I think uh, during the time of Israelites, uh, the, la the last plague was there and they used to put the blood of the lambs on the doorpost and the angel will pass. <laughs> uh, I think, and then here, I think it's all about the power of the blood and flesh. Things. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it, isn't it? Um, it's it was during their time at Egypt. Uh, they were commanded by God and uh, to post uh, the blood of an innocent lamb, a lamb that was without uh, blemish, uh, on on the doorposts and. Every house that had the do, uh, the blood on their doorposts, uh, where the angel of death would pass over, that means a judgment would not be pronounced over them, um, and that the judgment was was death, basically, isn't it? Um, uh, and so that's that's what it is. Uh, that's what. Uh, and it, what is amazing is um, when it didn't matter who was inside the house. Like even if it was an Egyptian that was inside the house, and if he was inside the house that had the blood on uh, on the doorpost, he was saved. He was uh, he was spared. Um, and there's so much to learn for, about just that, and how that anyone who is under the blood of Jesus has eternal life, isn't it? That's that's a beautiful. Uh, um, way to look at it, right? And uh, let's read some more scriptures, if that's all right. I'd like to read, uh, like someone to read, uh, First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty to thirty-four. Someone else, please. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse twenty to thirty-four. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verses twenty to thirty-four. Therefore, when you when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What do you, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize my was on mute. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you for reading that. Uh, and very quickly, can we also read uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 21, please, somewhere else? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 to 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 to 21. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean that? A sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the, de and the table of demons. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jacqueline. Right, so we look at... Um, I mean, we read a quite a, quite a bit. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, each, each of you, for reading that. So, we are studying about the sacrament. One of the, the second sacrament that Jesus instituted is the the Lord's table, right? The the communion, as we call it. Um, and so we we read that in Matthew chapter twenty six, verse eighteen to thirty, and how Jesus talks about the Passover and he breaks the bread and passes the cup, and all of that, and and then this instruction where Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 to 34, one of the key verses there is verse 23, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it, Paul is saying that I received this from the Lord. That means there was a revelation that he received from God himself on how this was taken and this is how it has to be done. Right? There are certain instructions that's been laid out. Right? And so that's what we will kind of look at, okay? And um, what what the Lord's table is all about, okay? So uh, the communion is open to all who are believers in Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, right? Uh, it's open to all the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we partake or celebrate the Lord's table, uh, once, it is an expression of our personal faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. Right? It's again same thing uh, as the water baptism. You are expressing you are expressing your personal faith because you uh, believe in Jesus Christ uh, as your personal Lord and Savior. You publicly confess and declare and proclaim by getting baptized, and then you continue and do to do so by partaking. Uh, in the communion, in the table, right of of uh, bread and and wine, so an expression of a personal faith in death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, a proclamation of the completed work of Christ on the cross. Right, every proclamation is powerful in the spiritual realm, and hence we can expect to receive the power of the cross invading our lives as we partake in the Lord's table. Okay, um, and it's an expression of our faith in his return, uh, an expression of our union with Jesus. We are declaring our communion with the body and the blood of Jesus, as we just read in First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Uh, and also, we're not just saying, when we partake of the table, we're not just declaring or proclaiming that, uh, you know, we are one with Jesus. We are also expressing that we are part of the body as a collective. As a church, as a local church, we are expressing that we are part of the body. We are in union with other believers of the local church. Okay, and you see, at least like three, four points are in common of what we've already studied about water baptism. Right, we are saying, "I belong to Him. He is my everything," uh, and the same power that is released, uh, you know, in our lives because our, of our obedience in water baptism is also released when we partake um, of the uh, of the communion. Okay, and so how can we um, so how can we prepare our hearts uh, for us to partake of this communion, for us to partake of the Lord's table, uh, is very important, right? Because uh, this is a, a covenant relationship, 
right? Uh, when we do this, we are saying, I'm giving you my word, so to speak. Right. And uh, this was taken very seriously. Uh, covenants, especially in the in that region, the Middle Eastern region, was taken very, very seriously. Right. Um, so, if you know anything about the covenants, basically, uh, two parties would come, and they would choose an animal, and they would kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, split the animals, cut cut it in half in different pieces, and both the parties would walk between the pieces of a uh, of the animal that has been uh, cut which means to say that if it's either one of us breaks a word or don't keep the word that we are giving what happened to this animal may it happen to me so that's basically what it's saying and you know when when god makes a covenant with abraham he again brings abraham brings the bull and it's all cut and you know abraham doesn't walk through that and only God goes through it. It's in other words, simply to say, it's imp uh, one of the uh, covenant names itself. He's a covenant keeping God that we call right. It's impossible for him to break his word. Uh, he keeps his word for generations and generations to come, and that is who he is. And right, and so, and and when we partake of this table we are in a covenant relationship with him we are saying we commit ourselves <clears throat> to one another in the way i live uh, the way i do everything is how i you know how i am in relationship with this god and so it's very important how we prepare ourselves when it comes to partaking of the lord's table Right. Uh, the first thing again paul writes is examine our lives and renouncing known sin examining our lives and renouncing known sin uh habitual sin uh or whatever uh would have happened if you're living a life of sin um examine yourselves uh because paul goes on to say you have to take partake of it in a worthy manner isn't it um so we look at it in just a second so examine our lives renouncing known sin uh taking the elements understanding and believing in what they represent um, the finished work of christ on the cross through his death and resurrection taking the elements understanding and believing in what they represent um, I, i'll never forget this uh it, this many years ago i forget 2006 or 7 um there was an evangelist uh from the united states who had come and we were having an all night prayer in church and uh, he was going to lead uh, the communion uh, during that all night service uh, all night prayer uh, and he took a wafer and he said you know I'd, I'd like to do this thing uh, before I partake of the wafer and he, he he would break the wafer just to remind himself that his body was broken uh, right and so and that it was it was just a moment and it's never left me and every time since then, every Sunday, at least from then on till now, every time I receive a wafer, I, I would break it just to remind myself the significance and the importance, uh, you know, of what it means, of what, you know, what Jesus did for me uh, personally on the cross, uh, right through his death and resurrection. So, um, yeah, and so, and as it says in the notes, right, it's in celebrating the Lord's table, we must expect the full blessing of the cross expected like you know you know what it means to expect right all of us have expected something in life you expect something for yourself you expect something from someone else you expect something from your family members our whole life sometimes is lived based on expectations isn't it and so here we are encouraged to expect full blessings of the cross and what is what what are they right salvation healing breaking bondages deliverance wholeness blessing provision and so much more right to be released into our lives you got to expect that when you're partaking it's like i'm partaking of this lord's table and i expect everything and you declare you proclaim it right psalm 91 says i will declare and pro i will declare of the lord that he is my strength he is my refuge he is my fortress right and so you expect and you declare so i declare healing over myself i declare healing over my family i declare deliverance over my family so 
because you are expecting and you believe what Jesus has done for you on the cross, right? So um, each time we partake of the Lord's table, we must welcome the power of the cross to be made effective in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, each time, every time you partake of God's table, of the Lord's table, you must welcome the power of the cross. Um, it is significant, isn't it, guys? Uh, it's so powerful. It's it's not now. It it just it's not just a mundane ritual thing that we are doing because it's been been done for like two thousand odd years. Um, what keeps it alive? Uh, what what brings meaning to it is that you know what it carries. You know what was done for you. If you if you don't uh, engage or understand or have any thought about what you're doing, what you're partaking of, is then it just becomes a ritual. It means nothing. It's just a wafer and juice. Sometimes it's not even tasty. <laughs> uh, but when you realize what it was, what it is, uh, what's been done and established for you on the cross, then it takes a whole different meaning altogether. Right? Um, so, and the elements... Uh, when we just move on to page 125 in your notes, right? The elements of bread and grape juice are symbolic. You need to understand that, okay? Uh, <laughs> we do not believe in transmutation. That is, the elements suddenly supernaturally become the actual flesh and blood of Jesus when you eat them. Uh, now, this is what people did not understand back then when Jesus said, uh, you, you know, partake of my, when you when you do this, you're partaking of my of my body and you're drinking my blood. You, Jesus lost a lot of fans, right? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, you know, we followed you, all this thing. Jesus lost a lot of fans then. Okay, <laughs> when he made the statement. And disciples were like, uh, we don't know what what it is, but we will stick with you. It was like that, you know. The disciples stuck with him. Uh, it's kudos to them, right? But everybody else did not really get understand what Jesus was really saying. But we need to understand this. We need to get this very clear. Okay, we do not believe in transmutation that suddenly these elements, bread and grape juice, becoming uh, the actual flesh and blood. They are symbolic. Okay, uh, you know, during the COVID time. Um, but for all a solid two and two two years or so, uh, we had churches online, right? Services online, and we had to partake of the communion. There had to be communion services as well. So you know, pastor would say, find any juice, a bread, or whatever it is, or if you have chapati, take it, roti, whatever it is. It's a symbol, right? If you don't have any juice, fine. You find a glass of water. It's it's a symbol, right? And so. Um, so that's what that's what's happening. Um, that's what's being explained at that point. There. Okay, so uh, we need to understand the power that is being unleashed uh, when we are partaking of the Lord's table. Right? Uh, any thoughts, guys? Any questions so far? Are you with me? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So Paul writes, uh, you have to partake it in a worthy manner. And so what does that mean there? Right. Uh, one of the issues Paul is addressing is the behavior of people at the Corinthian church. Behavior at the Corinthian church. There were two ways in which they were violating the Lord's table. Uh, the first one is they were partaking of the Lord's table as an act of worship and then also partaking of foods offered to idols as an act of worship toward the idol which paul calls idolatry okay so the problem there was really not the food okay guys so <laughs> it's basically they were serving two masters that was the problem okay it was really not the food paul could care less about it so the real problem there, as mentioned, was not the food, but with the reverence that was being given to the idol. And so eating something sacrificed to idol, uh, which also mean became a stumbling block to other new believers. <clears throat> so that was the issue. So it became a stumbling block to other believers. Okay, so, so the challenge or the problem there or the issue at hand was not the food. It was their lifestyle. 
right? Jesus very clearly says that you can't serve two masters. But the Corinthians were serving two masters. They wanted this, they were also doing that. That and Paul was like, that's not happening, guys. Okay. Uh, and the second point is mentioned is they had turned the Lord's table into some sort of feast. Okay, can someone please read First Corinthians 11, 20, 22, please? First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 to 22. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Shafina. So, uh, but there was no reverence. They were just treating it like any other thing. Like, you know, they could uh, come and partake of it however they wanted it to. Uh, but again, Paul is saying, you know, that's not how you partake of the, of the table. Right. So, um, they had turned the Lord's table into some sort of feast and hence the admonition to discern the body and partake in a worthy manner. So if we do so in a worthy manner, we receive the full blessing of the cross in our lives, which included healing, etc. If we do it without really, un uh, if we do it without really understanding or paying attention to the significance of what we are doing, uh, we miss receiving the blessing of the cross, right? Um, and hence, the Paul goes on to make that statement. Um, this is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died, etc. Is because there was really no reverence. And Corinthian, the Corinthian church were, they were known for being notorious uh, of, uh, you know, of living a life like this uh, inside and outside, two different lifestyles. And, okay. Um, but that's what Paul is kind of reminding us as well. And this is a good reminder for us also, isn't it? And how we treat the Lord's table. Uh, how are we, uh, you know, uh, are we coming to the table in a worthy manner? In Are we coming in reverence? Or are we just treating it like, okay, it's just another ritual thing that, that's been done for two, 2,000 odd years. So I'm just doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, and so that is uh, not right. That That is quite dangerous. Right. Um, it talks about the requirements there. The, uh, there is no explicit instruction in scripture that you must be water baptized before taking part in the Lord's table. Uh, now, m most of the churches, uh, I mean, to do that, saying, okay, you can partake of the Lord's table only if you are water baptized. Uh, but uh, this is at APC, right? Uh, we keep participation in the Lord's table uh, open to all born again believers. Right. If you believe in Jesus, uh, you are welcome to partake of the of the table, right? Of, of wafer and grape juice, as we say it. Um, so there is no explicit instruction. Um, but again, the only requirement is that you would believe. Are you a believer? Okay. Uh, great. So uh, we'll pa we'll pause here. We'll take a ten minute break, and we'll come back and we'll resume. All right. Take care.